Good evening. I'm Joe Atkins. I serve on the Dakota County Board and together with Commissioner Kathleen Gaylord and Commissioner Lori Halverson, uh, we want to extend a, uh, a big welcome to everybody who joined us this evening for this uh, February 16th um, town meeting. Uh, we'll start off, uh, we've, we're very fortunate to be joined by our Dakota County epidemiologist, Christine Lees, who's going to give us a walkthrough of uh, the latest information regarding COVID-19 vaccinations, um, and we'll have an opportunity for questions and answers. Commissioner Gaylord, then we'll talk about our small business uh, relief program. We'll hear from uh, Commissioner Halverson as well, uh, but mostly we want to hear from you. We look forward to getting your questions, your concerns. Uh, those uh, several people have already uh, sent in questions ahead of time that they'd like to have addressed tonight. So with that, I'm going to stop talking and turn it over to, uh, to Christine uh, to walk us through where things, uh, where things stand with respect to the latest information on COVID. Christine. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to go through a couple of updates on where we're at with um, our COVID-19 response, as well as updates particularly on our uh, vaccine rollout, as that is really the, the top hot topic of conversation right now. Um, so if you advance to the next slide. So where are we at right now as far as um, the data and the trends that we're seeing? Um, right now, our vaccine rollout has been underway now for over a month. And we've had 8% now of Dakota County residents get at least one of the doses of the COVID vaccine that's available. And this number keeps going up every day. And so um, keep watching that. And, and we keep uh, tracking who's completed the series as well. So um, it was at 2% when we last ran it. Um, our 14 day case rate. So this is what we've been tracking a lot, um, particularly related to school openings. And it, we've been watching that come down, which is a very good thing. Um, it had dropped to 31 at the end of last week. And we are kind of uh, projecting into this week that it will probably be at around 29. Um, and again, that's been trending down now for uh, the last couple months. Um, and it's very good to see that. Our weekly positivity rate last week went up just a little bit um, from 4.9 to 5.4. And I really wouldn't put too much into that at this point. We wanna look at, um, first of all, it's not a you know, very large increase. We also kind of wanna watch it over time. We really wanna watch at least that kind of two week period for, for trends of the data that we're seeing. And so overall, um, the numbers have been looking good. We've been seeing decreases in our case counts. Um, and particularly in long-term care residents, which we know um, are where a lot of our illnesses um, and deaths had occurred early on in this pandemic. And so um, due to all of that, we've also had um, a decrease in our um, newly reported deaths. So overall, the picture right now is um, improving and we, we're hoping that we continue to um, stay that way. And I see that our slides went done, but there they are back, thank you. On the next slide. And uh, so we get a lot of questions about where we're at right now with vaccinating here at the county. Um, so Dakota County Public Health, um, our vaccination program, um, we have just been finishing phase 1A. And so phase 1A was primarily focused on healthcare workers and individuals that were living in long-term care settings. And so we, um, have been working really hard to make sure we've covered these groups of people. We've been partnering with a group called Bluestone to provide on-site vaccinations for um, those individuals in long-term care settings. And then we've been working directly with um, a variety of clinics um, in the county and with our other um, EMS first responders to make sure they all receive vaccination as well. And um, at this point, we are almost done with this group and we've actually moved into 1B. And so that is, that's really exciting. Um, in the phase 1B category, um, the focus right now is to get our education and childcare workers. Um, and here at the county, that's our first um, group that we've been asked to focus on. There's another, other, another group, the 65 plus population. And you'll see the state um, has been working hard at trying to set up um, community-based clinics around the state. And you're gonna see more and more of those to try and also do some of those larger population-based clinics. Uh, next slide. 
And so we really um, are trying to do a lot of communications. We, we get a lot of questions and we really wanna make sure we're able to give people the answers they're looking for about who we're vaccinating and how to sign up and how to get vaccinated. So just wanna make sure everybody's aware of a couple places you can go. So on our website, um, we still have on our homepage for Dakota County, up at the top bar, you can click on um, COVID-19 and you'll come to all of the information and pages we have. It includes information on where you can get tested, where you can get vaccinated, what our, local, our most recent statistics are that we're seeing, all of those are there for you. Um, we also started recently a um, weekly update just on the vaccine and you can sign up to receive this um, as well. So if you're somebody who really wants to get up-to-date information in your um, inbox, this is a new resource that we just um, put up. So again, that will include who we're vaccinating, where we're at in the, in the rollout and how to get vaccinated. Um, and I think that's it for my slides for tonight. Thanks so much, Christine. We're obviously gonna come back to you here shortly, um, but we've got a, uh, an update from Commissioner Gaylord uh, about our small business relief program. Uh, Commissioner Gaylord is our longest serving Dakota County Commissioner. She's, uh, in, she's a, a lawyer as well as a small business owner. Kathleen, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Joe. Um, you know, as we've been dealing with all of uh, the, the COVID pandemic um, and, and we have focused on um, individuals and um, dealing with testing and now more recently vaccinations, but there's another group of, of entities in Dakota County, our small businesses and our nonprofits that um, are, are absolutely critical to our success here in Dakota County. And we know that in the past year, um, many of our small businesses have really struggled um, with the effects of shutdowns and economic changes that have um, resulted uh, from the COVID pandemic. Um, so Dakota County, um, in conjunction with the state and federal government has put together a number of programs. We've actually had four rounds of uh, small business relief grant funding um, to date that will provide, um, I think we're up to about $23 million worth of relief overall to, to um, Dakota County businesses. And the businesses that we're talking about um, are anything from service stations to um, carpet cleaning places to clothing stores to small uh, hair salons, um, dental offices, um, and of course, restaurants and bars. So one of the bars that we um, helped um, was a business uh, uh, in West St. Paul, Marty's Bar, and it's owned by Marty Simons. And um, we've got a video to give you a little bit about um, Marty's story. So um, I guess we'll just run the video. We were coming here when we were 18, right out of the get-go, right out of high school. Back then, the law was 18. You might say that Marty Simmons and this bar were destined for each other. I always hung out here. We always played softball for here. And then I got to know the owners. I heard it was for sale one day. She couldn't sell it. And then she approached me and said, Marty, you should buy this bar. And I said, I can't afford a bar. She said, well, how do you know? So I just kind of did the math and decided to try it. And it ended up being a great, great uh, investment. For more than 20 years, Marty's Bar has been the kind of place where everybody knows your name. It's, it's literally locals. Yeah, it's, it's just like on Cheers. But everything changed when the pandemic hit. I thought I would be okay with this shutdown, but I forgot about all my insurance. So that's four grand. Um, you still got to pay cable. You still got to pay heat. You still got to pay electricity. You got to keep all the coolers running. Yeah, there's still bills, you know. Um, still got to pay property taxes. All told, he needed about $5,000 a month just to keep Marty's bar alive. There's no ink. I have zero income coming in. That's when he heard about and applied for Dakota County's Small Business Relief Grant Program. And then that grant from you guys was awesome. That was kind of, that was late in the game here. So that kind of, that helped out a lot too. Dakota County distributed grants of up to $15,000 to small businesses like Marty's Bar when it was needed most. The Board of Commissioners authorized a fourth round of relief grants in January. The program made more than $8 million available for grants. 
I just, I'm very appreciative of it. The money I got from you guys would last a month, <laughs> but it helps. <laughs> So we are right now in our fourth round. Um, uh, the uh, deadline for application just closed last week. And so we will be um, going through those applications to uh, distribute another uh, eight, over $8 million to uh, businesses that have uh, applied in this, in this round. And judging from what's going on at the federal level, there may be more money that'll be coming. Um, and so, um, you know, the, the need is still there and we're doing what we can to, to try to help. Thank you so much. Uh, nobody's been more of a zealous, zealous advocate on behalf of small business owners and their employees than you have. Um, and we, uh, we appreciate you being here. I know that there's some questions that have already been coming in um, that are regarding that small business relief program and other items that, uh, that you have uh, certainly some knowledge with respect to. We've also got Commissioner Lori Halverson. We went from our longest serving county commissioner, Kathleen Gaylord, to our newest county commissioner, uh, but no uh, no stranger to public service, Commissioner Lori Halverson. Um, Lori, do you wanna uh, say a few words about the transition from, uh, from going from the state government to, to coming here to Dakota County? Pardon me. Well, sure. Um, thanks a lot for, um, uh, having us here and thanks to everybody who's joined us. I'm Lori Halverson. I, um, some of you may know me, I served uh, eight years at the state capitol um, representing Egan's District 51B. Uh, did a lot of work with regard to health and human services, which means I worked a lot on county policy because the counties carry out a lot of this policy. And uh, as well, I, I chaired the Commerce Committee, which um, I think is, is probably the, the greatest committee at the capitol. I don't know what you think, Joe. <laughs> I got to follow in Joe's footsteps during the Commerce Committee. So, um, and uh, also did a lot of work on government operations, which also has oversight for um, local government. And in that time, um, uh, certainly I've always had a real passion for, for local government because uh, local government is really close to you. Um, if if uh, something's happening in your day-to-day -day lives, very often it's local government that has a jurisdiction over it. And um, you want people in your community who um, you can connect to about those things. Um, you might not even know what they are, but you know, if your snow isn't plowed and, and your garbage isn't picked up, those things really make a difference. So, um, so when Tom Egan decided to retire, I, I uh, decided to run for Dakota County Board and I'm really grateful to be here. Um, it's, uh, there's a lot to learn with the county because the county carries out so many um, direct services. Um, at the same time, I feel really grateful for my experience at the state um, and uh, my colleagues on the board because the transition is, is um, uh, somewhat seamless. Uh, a, a good example is the, the state funding that uh, we passed in the legislature in December um, that uh, it, Commissioner Gaylord was just talking about this $8 million worth of grants. And one of the pieces of the conversation that I was so grateful for was um, the recognition that we needed to get money out the door quickly. Um, as that video that Marty said, you know, it's like he's looking for um, help a month at a time and every little bit helps and we needed to get dollars into business owners hands quickly. And the state um, was very clear that they, they knew that counties were uh, the best way to be responsive to the community as quickly as possible and would be able to distribute the, the dollars as quickly as possible. And so I got to pass that bill at the state and then um, come over to the county and, and uh, uh, be part of the, the distribution, which is really important. The same is true with health, um, that uh, the, the state and the county are, are really um, part of um, building um, blocks to uh, COVID testing, COVID vaccines, and COVID health information. And, and uh, one does not kind of uh, exist without the other. And so um, with the state, you know, the state has got their, their lottery, the state is focusing on um, certain populations with vaccines. Um, the county um, is, is uh, also a piece of that, that building block. Um, and then the federal government as well, the federal government's uh, focus right now is pushing it out to our local pharmacies. So we're getting all of these um, uh, different avenues in place. So as soon as there's a vaccine supply, it's going in somebody's arm. 
And so um, putting all that infrastructure in place and making it work together is, is really the way our governments work together. And we don't always get to see that happening. I think COVID is almost making it more visible how um, these different levels of government work together. So um, that's just a little bit of my vantage point from those two um, areas of service. Laurie, it's been great having your perspective. It's uh, not just uh, not just your point of view, but the connections that you have at the state have, uh, have made it a, a terrific um, add to our to our board. Not that we don't miss uh, Commissioner Egan. We wish him well in uh, in his retirement, but it's been great to have you on board with us as well. And with that, folks, it's 7:15. Um, I'm really proud of the uh, the presentations that have been given because we. This is a town hall meeting. The point of a town hall is to hear from folks who come in, in attendance and hear the questions and concerns that you have. For anybody that hasn't been on one of these meetings before, uh, if you scroll down to the bottom, you'll see a, uh, a chat feature and you can just uh, plop your question into the chat and we'll try to get to just as many as we possibly can. I also uh, have something like 27 questions that were emailed in or texted in um, before we even got underway this evening. So. We'll try to get to just as many as we possibly can, but please fill up the chat room uh, with the uh, with the questions. In fact, we've got one I saw, well, they're already popping up. We've got Chris uh, asked, so Christine, I think this one would be for you. Chris asks, is there any update as to when high risk medical conditions will get vaccinated? You wanna take a shot at that one, please? Sure, no problem. Yes, yeah, so um, right now, um, the plan is that individuals, um, particularly adults 16 to 64 years of age with underlying medical conditions will be part of one, the 1C one group. So we have phase one um, that we're still in and we're kind of right in the middle in phase 1B. Uh, and when we get to phase 1C is when um, additional individuals that are under the age of 65 with underlying medical conditions um, are going to be um, next on the priority list. Great, thanks, Christine. Um, one of the questions that got emailed in ahead of time was, do you recommend double masking? Yeah, this has gotten a lot of attention recently in the media. Um, so first, with masking, one, two, three, the most important part is that you actually have one that fits, okay? So first of all, make sure your mask is fitting, that it's, um, has a good seal, particularly around the, the nose area, um, and it's covering below the chin. Um, and so as far as double masking, um, there is some um, school of thought that particularly if you wear one of the stronger um, KN95 masks, um, the actual N95 masks are still under sh uh, short supply and just for healthcare workers, but there's KN95s out there and they do have stronger protection. So some individuals prefer to wear that with another surgical mask. And so um, does it provide some extra benefit? We don't know 100%, but it seems like that that is potentially the case. And so some individuals are choosing to do that. It's not, CDC is not formally recommending it, but that KN95 plus a surgical or a cloth mask on top certainly um, is something people are doing for added protection. Thanks, Christine. Another one, I guess this would be for you as well, and it doesn't surprise me that a lot of questions are for you, Christine, but uh, do I still need a mask once I get both doses of the vaccine? Yes, I know everybody's just waiting to not wear masks anymore. <laughs> um, so the, what's going on with, with masks and vac vaccination is that we, we need to complete some studies and they're underway right now to make sure that if you've been fully vaccinated, could you still transmit the virus to somebody else if you've been exposed to it? So your immune system is going to kick in and fight it off so you don't get sick. But while your, your immune system is doing that, can you pass it on? We're hoping that the answer is no. And that way we could get to a point where, you know, that's necessary, not necessary. But right now we don't know that. And it's really important we keep masking until we have that science because we've got to keep those numbers down while this vaccine um, is getting out so we can slow that spread as much as we can. And Joe, can I have um, Christine just elaborate on, on something? Please, sorry, go right ahead. Um, I think the double masking um, conversation is a really good um, illustration of what I have seen termed the Swiss cheese effect that we're all, you know, it's like there is no one perfect answer to preventing the spread of COVID other than sitting in your home 
all the time and never leaving, which some people have done. Um, but so, you know, some people have to be at work. Some people have to, um, you know, interact with the public. Um, uh, our kids are going to school. And so it's the mask and the vaccine and the um, distancing and um, the limiting time indoors. And it's all of those things together um, that are get, going to get us where we need to go as opposed to um, the one thing. And I think all of us want to see the one thing um, <laughs> that gets us back with family, friends, um, the shots of that bar. I wanted to go sit at that bar and, and uh, have that guy pour me a drink. Uh, but <laughs> until then, I'm, I'm, I'm staying home. And so um, I, if you just could maybe comment on, um, you know, or elaborate at all on, on that whole notion of the Swiss cheese, that it's not just the one thing. Yes, I've heard that analogy used too, and I think you're right that um, we're using everything, every tool, we say every tool in the tool belt right now to really um, deal with this virus. And until we get there, the magic there place, um, we really need to keep using all those tools because the more that we use, um, the more effective that they will be together. So the more people that are getting vaccinated, the more people that are wearing masks and following those precautions, all of these things are gonna help us get to where we need to be um, to stop this, this virus from, from doing what it's doing in our community. So you're exactly right. Um, it takes all of us doing these things and, make, and it does really make a difference. Another question that came in, Kathleen, I think this one would be best for you. We had a question about, uh, that there, were, there was an effort to assist restaurants uh, that serve liquor. Did the county ex um, undertake any efforts to assist restaurants that don't serve liquor? Well, yes. Um, actually, uh, we had uh, one of our rounds um, was specifically targeted to those restaurants that had liquor licenses. And um, we did that because of um, some concerns about those particular restaurants and how this was affecting them um, uh, through this pandemic. Um, restaurants that don't serve liquor um, have been helped through the regular um, small business uh, relief uh, programs that we've had. So um, in the case of the um, liquor license only round, um, I think that was a $5,000 um, number that we were doing. These other rounds that we've had have been up to $15,000. And so um, we're trying to um, attack the problem in a lot of different ways. And I guess, as I mentioned earlier, um, this we're now into our fourth round and I wouldn't be surprised if we didn't have the fifth and maybe a sixth round as we go forward. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, I, bouncing back, I see a question from Cheryl. This looks again for Christine. What group are you in if you have underlying conditions and are over 65? When will that number come up and where would you go to get on the list? Sure. So if you're over 65 right now, there's a couple of options for you. Um, the state is setting up these some community um, clinics, and I'm sure you may have heard about them in the news. If you haven't, you go to mn.gov, and the mn.gov site is where you find the list of the state's kind of community-based clinics for that 65 plus group. And so it's still a lottery system because we just don't have enough vaccine yet for that group. And as we get more and more vaccine, you're going to see more and more of those community clinics for the entire 65 plus group. So go to that site. That's um, an important place to go. And the other thing is that we are hearing about more and more um, clinics and pharmacies that are also starting to offer appointments for 65 plus. So check with your local clinics and pharmacies. And that same website, min.gov, has a map that you can go on to find um, other sites that are giving vaccines. So definitely check that out if you're 65 plus. Um, a couple of the clinics are specifically even serving 75 plus right now, um, but check there because there's some other options for, for you if you're in that population. Right. If you go, th Joe, if you go through um, min.gov, they have a, a page called Find My Vaccine, and that is a good resource to get to the, um, the state-run clinics, especially um, 
but there are also, if you're in, for example, I, I know people who have health partners and health partners has called some people to get them in for vaccines and other people have called their health partner um, contact and been able to get on lists and get the vaccine. Um, I know you care and some of the others, a similar situation. Some of the um, private clinics that you're probably going to where your doctor is may be getting vaccines, but may, it may still be a little early for them to get some of that. But there's also now um, what the federal government is doing is, is getting them out to more um, um, decentralized places, um, pharmacies in particular. Um, and I was just on a call with the White House um, about um, the push out for to get um, some of these vaccines out into onto the pharmacies. So here in Minnesota, um, it's Thrifty White and it is Walgreens. And my understanding is Walmart might be also be doing them too. So um, there is a, if you go on to the, for example, the Walgreens site, there is a special, there's a place there where they will tell you where these are and if they have them. Um, when I checked it yesterday, it said they didn't have any in a, a 25 uh, mile radius of us uh, for the next three days at least. So you just have to kind of keep trying and there's just various ways of doing this right now. Um, and you just have to try all those different ways and hopefully get yourself on, on the list and get yourself an appointment and, and, and that's how you can do it. Kathy, I see Lori's unmuted. Could, oh, did you want to add to that, Lori? I could add to that. That was um, really great uh, information, um, you know, from, from Commissioner Gaylord and, and thank you for that. I think we have another Swiss cheese metaphor or building blocks mm -hmm. metaphor. And we have, um, uh, so it's, I've heard a lot from the, the provider community. I spent uh, quite a bit of time on the phone with um, the person who is in charge of Alina's distribution system uh, a week or so ago to figure this okay. out. And um, clinics are, are trying to be proactive and contacting um, people who have been in their patient community for the last three to five years, depending on the, the clinic system. And so as they get vaccine, they've got um, people in the queue um, and they will contact people directly um, if they have your proper contact information. So there's a lot of recommendation to make sure that you are in touch with your um, healthcare provider, your doctor's office, so that they have your phone number and email um, so that they can get in contact with you um, when you can um, get into that queue. And uh, some people, it feels like uh, some people that everybody's getting a vaccine all of a sudden because you know people are posting it on Facebook. And um, but keep in mind, as as Christine said, it's been eight percent of the population of Dakota County so far. So we're still waiting for the the volume of vaccine to catch up to the the number of population. But all indications are that it's moving in the right direction, and that's where we need it to go. And I think back to when it was really hard to get a test. And now, uh, you know, a week ago, I was at the Air Marine in River Oak Heights getting, getting a test. So it's, um, and you can just pop in and show up there. And so um, I, I think we're going to see that kind of exponential growth and availability. And so um, as much as we're saying, take proactive steps, there's also um, patients that's going to end up going along with that. And I see somebody in the chat asked about all the online contact and and that's why I wanted to make mention that um, making sure that your doctor's office has your updated contact information is important because um, that is one of the, the goals is to make sure that people aren't falling through the cracks because they don't have um, access to, uh, you know, computer or it don't have that comfort level um, with a computer. Um, that said, uh, we also have um, our Dakota County Public Health that is also doing outreach with vulnerable populations to make sure that um, they're not falling through the cracks. So if all of these systems are working together, we'll get there and just want people to hang in there. As you mentioned, by the way, thank you both Kathy and Lori. That's uh, a great, uh, great bit of additional detail. And these town hall meetings, by the way, are, are open for criticism too. And I, I think that's a fair criti uh, critique is that Connie raised, why are we doing it all online? For those over 65 and even 75 who are the least computer literate, although I know a lot of pretty computer literate uh, folks who are uh, in that category, but that's a, a fair comment. We've also got the MinGov, MN.gov site, list clinics and pharmacies. This is from Joan. Um, supposedly are offering appointments for vaccines. 
but in fact, the links don't take you anywhere that allows you to make an appointment. Um, the, uh, Christine, do you wanna take a swing at, I know that we've, we've talked about getting um, written materials. Uh, there was a good suggestion here from uh, 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 Commissioner Halverson, I think it was about being in contact with your, with your clinic, um, your own doctor. Uh, by phone. Any other helpful suggestions about how folks in, in those age categories would be best uh, best suited to be able to snag an appointment? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it is, and it is really important, um, and we are thinking and planning for this all the time, to think about who are we not reaching. And, and, and you're absolutely right. Who are we not reaching? And, and people that have um, technology or other types of access issues is a group that we're concerned about, and we are working to get to that. I would say particularly in the 65, 75 plus group, again, because they are being served right now in many different settings, it is worth making some of those phone calls as um, Commissioner Gaylor talked about to your clinic or to the pharmacy. Um, but in addition, if you are interested, um, we also still have our hotline open here at Dakota County and you could call and talk with one of our nurses. And when we get to those situations here at the county, we will have other options as far as paper, phone registration. And we're also making sure our communications team is thinking about a lot of different ways to make sure we're sharing our information. So it's not just online, it's also in press releases. So it's still maybe in the, the you know newspaper that's coming out that some Somebody in um, a different age category might be um, paying more attention to. So um, it's something we're concerned about and working at. Um, and I think you're going to continue to see this grow and develop and diversify, um, particularly um, to, to get to these groups that are not, um, we're not reaching yet. Thanks so much, Christine. We, and I'm glad you mentioned the hotline. We will post that phone number in, uh, in the chat. Uh, we'll also mention it later on this in the meeting that uh, that hotline is open, has been open since COVID struck uh, several months ago. And I can, I can state firsthand, because I've called and talked to them, um, that uh, they answer quickly, they answer accurately. It's, uh, it's the, one of the best places to get up-to-date information about what's going on with respect to COVID and COVID vaccines. Um, by the way, Linda, I am not ignoring your question about uh, townhomes or homes that are going in on Clayton in a traffic study. I just don't have an answer for you. Uh, not with the folks who are on the meeting this evening. Um, City of Invergrove Heights is taking up that uh, uh, that question, and I will cut and paste your question and uh, seek to get an answer back to you with respect to that one as well. Um, next up, we have uh, what is will the IGH Armory eventually provide vaccines? Christine, do you happen to know that? Yeah, we're looking at the armory. We're looking at a number of sites, and it's definitely been um, talked about. Why, you know, could we use some of our current testing sites? Could they become vaccine sites? You know, absolutely. We are have a number of community sites, including that that um, Invergrove Armory. And and honestly, the biggest the biggest issue right now is we just don't have enough vaccine to open up all of these sites. And so as we see that vaccine continue to roll into the state you're gonna see more and more sites opening like that. So absolutely, we're looking at the armory and other geographic areas across the county, make sure that we're looking at community sites that will be, once we have enough vaccine, we can really start to roll out faster. And on a, uh, on a similar note, I have, and I, I cut this question down quite a bit. It was a, it's a um, story that uh, a woman told me she's 85, she's not in long-term care. Uh, and her question essentially was, what is the best way to, for me to get vaccinated? Christine, what would you tell her to do? If she has a clinic that she, a primary care clinic that she goes to, go there first, because especially at her age, they want to get her served. That category, we know that that's a high risk group. Um, so if she has a, you know, any connection to that primary care clinic, um, please make sure to check with them. And the other group are our pharmacies. So our pharmacies have been very um, active. So call your local pharmacy, see if they're vaccinating. A lot of them are, um, because it'd be really, you know, especially with that age group, we really wanna make sure you're getting an appointment if at all possible. So you're not standing and waiting in line somewhere. Um, certainly that lottery is an option for you. That is always um, out there. Um, but if you can call, get an appointment, um, call your provider, call the pharmacy, see if you can get in either there, I would suggest. Thanks, Christine. Um, and I'm not going to say this person's name, but uh, it's a gentleman who said, any update on when younger people with underlying conditions can get vaccinated? My wife is 28 with a serious heart condition. 
Yeah, so um, anybody that's got um, a significant underlying condition is gonna be in that 1C group. So as soon as we're done with the 1Bs, then we'll move to 1C and they're part of that category if they're um, under 65 years of age. Right now, um, the vaccines are only licensed for emergency use down to age 16. So right now it's we're anticipating 16 to 16, 64 year olds with underlying conditions will be in that 1C group and we're hoping you know, it takes, it's been taking us about a month to get through them, but I think it's, it'll hopefully be speeding up. So, um, you know, hopefully by sometime in March, we'll be getting into that 1C group here. We're just about halfway through February, I guess, so. On a somewhat similar note, Rachel asks, any update? Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I was about to read the same question over again. What is the status of vaccine development for children? And is there an ETA? Yeah, absolutely. So the vaccines um, like Moderna and Pfizer's vaccine that we have now, they're, they're continuing to do age studies, lowering that age. Um, and so they're testing them right now in the pediatric population. And so it's kind of going to follow that same process that we saw for the adult studies, but it can get, um, they have to go through um, these populations, make sure it's effective, make sure that there's not significant side effects. Um, and so that is going on right now. Um, and so, uh, you know, we're hopeful that by the time we kind of get to that pediatric group in phase two, um, which we're hopefully, you know, will be around April, May, and, and into June is when we're going to be doing those general population-based groups that would be um, pediatrics that will have some vaccines available. Um, there's also several new ones that are coming out um, that we're watching really closely. Johnson & Johnson's has applied for emergency use. Um, and AstraZeneca's too. So the, it, the, the diversification of vaccines available is going to keep growing. Thanks, Christine. Um, Commissioner and so oh, one, of those, one of those issues around um, um, some of these other specific populations are um, if you're pregnant, do you get a vaccine or not? Um, and it's, it's somewhat like um, the pediatric side of the equation. There isn't a lot of data out there yet. And so um, there really isn't anything that says that that's a problem, but um, if you're in a specific um, category, you, maybe you're susceptible to some uh, of the vaccines, um, uh, allergic to them or some other things, or you've got some kind of a condition, you know, and I think the best um, advice that when people have asked me about it is I say, if you're pregnant, you're probably going to your regular doctor on a regular basis talk to your doctor and ask them um, if, if it's okay for you to, to, to take the vaccine and, and, and try to use that resource um, to be, make sure that you're safe. That was actually, thank you for raising that one. That was a question that came in, um, or a similar question. It was to a person of, and I, I should pull up the actual question, but it was uh, for women of childbearing age, um, you recommend getting the, uh, or who are trying to get pregnant, uh, would you recommend getting vaccinated? Christine, I, Kathy, thank you. I'm gonna come back to you. Yeah, federal government. that's fine. That, you know, and that, that's the fertility argument that's out there. It's one of those, there's all kinds of information out there that isn't particularly right. Um, and um, there is no evidence that, that um, I've seen and maybe Christine, it has something different that says that there's any problem with fertility as a result of the COVID-19 um, vaccination. Christine? Yeah, Commissioner Gaylord is um, exactly correct. So actually most um, uh, OBGYNs are recommending the vaccine for um, pregnant women and also um, mothers that are nursing is also in that same category. Mm -hmm. And yes, there is a lot of unfortunately uh, misinformation around fertility. Um, and actually, we uh, we offer vaccine to we are able to vaccinate women that are pregnant or who are um, nursing mothers. Um, we do recommend you talk to your provider because that is a relationship that's really important. But it's certainly not necessarily, as we'd say, a contraindication. You can still get it, and um, we are seeing a lot of the OBGYNs really recommend it. So talk to your provider. You can you can still come in and get it. Um, that's the recommendation. Yeah. Kathy, do you want to take a shot? I know you follow what's going on at the federal level. Um, the question is, will I get a $1,400 check from the federal government and when? And uh, I, know, I know you're not a member of Congress, but- uh, Well, I, I, can, I can try to answer it. Um, nobody knows. 
<laughs> um, but um, a little more specific, you know, there is a COVID bill that is going through Congress right now. Um, they uh, have come up with a way to get it through um, a, uh, Congress, and it's hopeful that those um, fourteen um, hundred dollar checks will be coming to people um, uh, who qualify. But um, my understanding is that they're probably there's kind of a date out there, um, and I think it's the middle of March when a lot of um, uh, unemployment benefits and other benefits are gonna fall away unless something is done. So I think that's kind of the target date to get it done so that um, they're able to get those checks out to people starting sometime in hopefully in March. I, I but they gotta pass the bill first. It's gotta get through Congress. <laughs> Certainly, and you know, the Dakota County Board doesn't guarantee what Congress will do. I don't think anybody could do that, but I knew I'd, uh, I was calling on the right person. Um, to give a snapshot of where things uh, where things might be back might be at with respect to that, um, the uh, the next question I had was uh, what's the oh I okay uh, Christine uh, the question is why do we need a vaccine that is seventy to ninety five percent effective for a virus that has a ninety nine percent recovery rate and a 94.5% recovery rate for those age 70 or older. You wanna take a swing at that one? Sure, yeah, um, there's a lot of, a lot of percents in that uh, question, but I think, I think really there's two, I think, main points around that. First of all, um, having a vac two vaccines right now that are as effective as they are is really uh, a miracle. I mean, we did not anticipate that we would have a vaccine, let alone two vaccines that were gonna be this effective this quickly. So. That is, uh, we, we didn't ever anticipate that. Um, and so it's a really good thing. Um, and even though we know that many, you know, many, many people who get COVID um, have minimal symptoms and recover, the full story is not there in saying 99% of people get better, right? There's a lot more to that, a lot more um, ongoing conditions that people have even after they've um, recovered from COVID. So that 99% really does not tell the story of, how many people um, might have longer uh, long-term side effects from that illness. And so, you know, the fact that we have a vaccine that's effective is just means that we're gonna be able to get to that point where we can really stop it, the spread um, faster in our community. So that's why, um, do we have to have it this effective? No, but it is a good thing. And, and again, that, that percent, you know, just, it doesn't tell all of the stories of so many people um, who've been really affected by it. So. Shake the dice. If you get it and get better, you are lucky, and that's a good thing. But not everybody that shakes the dice is gonna, you know, do okay. So you really need to remember that that many people do have long term effects and significant illness. And, uh, could I follow up on that with a second sure. question um, for Christine? Um, so there's a lot of misinformation about the disease itself, um, as, as you talked about, but there's also been some question about how could we possibly get a vaccine online this quickly? Um, and, uh, you know, I look, I, I'm like, well, this is what happens when the entire scientific community in the world is focused on one thing at a time, at the same time. I don't know that it's ever happened before, but so I think that there's was some questions um, certainly, you know, and the folks, uh, we heard it that there's some folks in, in healthcare settings who are like, I don't know if I'm ready, if I feel like it's safe yet, um, but they're starting to come around and say, okay, I think it's safe. Can you talk a little bit about how we got an effective vaccine so quickly? Yeah, as I mentioned, it really, it really is a miracle. It, it was a huge scientific breakthrough that the, the technology, this messenger RNA technology that's in both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, um, has been being developed for many years. And actually it was on the cusp of developing a vaccine that would be effective against Ebola. If you remember, we had that large Ebola outbreak in Western Africa a number of years ago. Um, and, and so this technology, it really gets us out of what we've kind of called the dark ages of vaccine development. So for a long time, we have been really dealing with vaccines in, in, in a pretty archaic way. And so particularly with viruses, um, if we rely on growing the virus and then either killing it off and then, you know, manipulating it to use it in a vaccine, 
it's really hard and difficult to do that. So what this technology does is you don't need to actually grow the vaccine. You're able to do a small, uh, create that small messenger RNA that's needed for our body to kick in and create the proteins and the responses needed. Um, so I know that's kind of a lot of science in there, but but really what's fascinating is that it it really has modernized us, us and we've needed to get there. And there was a lot of funding that went into this. And so that Operation Warp Speed, um, if you remember at the federal level, really did help to fund it because it's a lot of risk to for companies to take on to develop this. Um, so that was a huge, huge part of that success as well. Interesting. Um, I, I'm not gonna identify who sent me the note because it came just to me directly, but it was just a little pushback. It is really frustrating to hear a family in Colorado and Indiana and, and other neighbors uh, here who've received vaccines. My wife and I are between 68 and 74. It seems like we're at the bottom of a rugby scrum. Uh, and I, uh, I, I say that because again, in town meetings, it's also an opportunity to share your concerns and, your, and things that are frustrating to you. And I, uh, uh, for, the, for the group's sake, I wanted to share that. Um, I appreciate the frustration, I think, and I expect, and I hope that uh, in the coming weeks, and Christine, Kathleen, Lori, if you want to weigh in on this as well, it seems like it's starting to shape up a little bit, like things are getting smoother, the number of doses is, uh, that are coming into Dakota County and the provider seems to be increasing, uh, and I'm starting to get a little more cautiously optimistic, but tell me folks, am, am I wrong in that? Are you feeling the same thing, Commissioner Gaylord? I think, you know, uh, Commissioner Halverson, um, used an analogy to testing. Um, and I think that's a good one to try to understand where we are in this whole process. Um, I was very sick the first part of March and I convinced myself, even though I didn't have a fever that I, that I must have had COVID. And I worked like crazy to find a way to get tested. And in March, you couldn't, they, if you went in even with COVID symptoms, they weren't testing you for COVID. They test you for flu or they test you for, um, uh, I don't know, strep or anything else, but not, not COVID. And, and so um, as we've evolved in that, I mean, if you need a, a COVID test today, there are a dozen places up and down Robert Street that you can get them. Um, so I think we're gonna get there. It just it's just gonna take, um, you know, we don't have the supply. Um, we're just setting up sites. We're just kind of getting into it. I mean, everybody wants to be at the front of the line, but, um, and, I, and I certainly can understand that, but I think um, we will see it get much better as we go forward. And it actually, um, just in the last couple of weeks, it's gotten so much better. Um, and there's so many more opportunities for people to get the vaccine that I think um, um, if you can just um, hang in there for a few more weeks, I think you're going to see a big difference. And, and I would agree wholeheartedly. Um, it, I think one of the um, promising developments is that the federal government is going to be shipping directly to um, our pharmacy partners um, that mm -hmm. we've identified as Thrifty White, Walmart, and, and uh, Walgreens in, in Minnesota. And uh, we saw the, the um, long-term care vaccinations get off to kind of a slow start um, when we partnered with CVS um, and Walgreens to do our long-term care vaccinations. But um, once that got rolling, and Christine can maybe say this, it got rolling fast and, and we really got through um, that really vulnerable population and it's having a, making a big difference in terms of outcomes and health in, in long-term care facilities. So. Um, and we're putting the structures into place. In fact, just today on our um, Dakota County board meeting, we talked about um, uh, the way public health is um, building up uh, a core of volunteers and helpers who can help with marshalling at sites. And so all of the structure is in place so that as soon as um, the vials are there, um, they're going into needles and they're going into arms because uh, all of the structure around that is in place. So. Yep. We're going to get there. We're so close. <laughs> I think we can all see July. <laughs> We're ready. Thank you both. Uh, one of the questions on, on that uh, front I've, it was, I've had COVID. 
do I really need to get the vaccine? And Christine, I think we'll go back to you for that question. Yeah, um, you should still get the vaccine. Um, and you could wait for a period of time, definitely wait until your symptoms have subsided. So if it's been a recent infection, um, normally, you know, they recommend waiting at least a couple of weeks, 14 days. Um, but other than that, it is still important to get vaccinated. And the reason why is because the um, immune response from the vaccine has shown to be effective for longer at this point. And for how long, we don't know exactly, but the effectiveness, um, if you've had it exposed to it and gotten better, your body's immune system, that response isn't quite as strong. And that's what we've seen in the science. So we're saying, yeah, even if you got it, please get, you're gonna to wanna to get vaccinated because it's gonna give you longer lasting protection and um, you don't have to worry about losing that as fast. And that was one of the next questions was how long does, does the vaccination last? Is there any speculation at this point, Christine, that you know of, or is it well, still? Yeah, I mean, we don't really, we really don't know yet. But the, you know, the first doses of Moderna were given almost a year ago. So those first folks who got Moderna, it was the beginning, you know, it was end of March, beginning of April. And so that first cohort is being watched really closely. Um, so we've seen a lot of really promising results with um, these two vaccines that the, that the immune response is lasting for a while. Is that going to be a year? Is it going to be five years? I I really don't know. Um, but but the good news is that we're seeing a, a, the immunity lasting almost to a year out now, so that's a good sign. And Marcy had a question that was, uh, which vaccine would you get, Moderna or Pfizer? And perhaps the Johnson and Johnson are, will be out as well. But what would you recommend? Absolutely, get whatever vaccine you can. <laughs> um, both the Moderna and the Pfizer are, they are very similar in technology, very similar across the board, data, side effects, all of it. Um, there's hardly, there's very little difference between the two. I would say get either. And, and when we see the new ones come out, look at them. I, it, honestly, whatever you can get, it's gonna give you that protection as soon as you can. Thank you, Christine. Uh, folks, we still have a, um, a few minutes if anybody's got questions that they want to post in the chat room. Otherwise, I'm reading the ones that have been submitted previously. And I, in fairness, and I apologize, but I shortened a lot of them up. Um, so they, uh, I, hopefully I still caught the flavor. One was simply, are the county libraries open? The answer is yes. Yes. Is, is there free <laughs> Wi-Fi at the county libraries? Um, yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> and in, in fact, there's, um, for checkout, you can do Wi-Fi hotspots and Chromebooks. Uh, the, uh, I'm concerned about going in a Dakota County library. Can I still check out materials? And there is curbside checkout where you can submit your, uh, your uh, request and it will be filled and placed at the, at the curb for pickup. Uh, Lori, uh, Commissioner Halverson, you wanted to, uh, are the Diffley Road safety improvements? This has nothing to do with COVID. It just is a question that came in. Are the Diffley Road safety improvements going to get done this summer? Uh, yeah, so um, just last week, there was a, a round of uh, uh, public meetings um, and uh, lots of great questions and lots of great answers. Um, the plan for the Diffley Road um, improvements are uh, to start construction in May and have the majority of that completed by August. I say the majority of that because um, there are three government agencies that are working on this project. The county has the bulk of it. Um, the city of Egan is a part of this, as well as uh, District 196. And District 196 has um, um, undertaken a Safe Routes to School um, planning grant. And so there will likely be additional um, uh, Safe Routes um, planning and implementation that the school district will do as well. Um, but I think that a really important partnership has been created through this process. And so um, the, uh, the plan is that it will start uh, in May and be ready when the kids go uh, back to school. And um, it's really important, I think, to note that there are multiple um, pedestrian bike uh, crossings that are being created in that space and that traffic will be slowed tr tr tremendously and it'll be um, single lane where we're going to have people cross with um, safety um, uh, islands in between those two lanes. So it's um, uh, a lot of big changes are coming to Diffley that will make it not just safer for the kids, but anybody who's shopping over in Diffley Marketplace, anybody who's um, utilizing the, the ball fields over at Northview. Um, so uh, I 
really good. And, and the um, discussion is online. Um, all of the information I'll post it in the chat, but honestly, the discussions were very illuminating and some great questions were asked and answered. So thanks. All right, Commissioner Gaylord, you asked, this is fine, that you asked a question about this very program earlier today with regard to the emergency rental assistance program. Um, the question here, though, must be from a, or it is from a landlord. Can landlords help their tenants get emergency rental assistance? And can landlords apply on behalf of the tenant? Is that one you want to take a swing at? Well, it's a pretty easy one. I guess the answer is yes. Um, in fact, we just talked about it at uh, a meeting today uh, to set up um, a, the program. Um, we're still working on the specific guidelines, but um, it would be something that if you are a landlord and you're having some difficulty um, um, collecting all your rents, um, or even a tenant who's having difficulty paying all their rents, um, there will be some uh, um, opportunity um, to get assistance um, from the county here, uh, actually, probably within the next few weeks. And of course, that's available to tenants as well, but it, uh, it's, mm -hmm. I think it surprises people when they find out that yeah. the landlord can actually assist with that. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, Christine, this one is, is uh, for you. It's from Sue, uh, posted in the chat. And, it, uh, and I know we get our guidance from the state and from the CDC, but is there any consideration that you're aware of to offering vaccine to people of color first as they are at higher risk? Yes. Um that actually has come up in a number of our questions um, that we've been looking at around disparities with COVID. We know that some of our communities of color, um, that the outcomes have, there's disparities in the outcomes as far as severity. And so that has been talked about. And um, I know that the, the allocation work group at the state has talked about how we can be really making sure we're addressing that in the vaccine rollout. And I think we've still got a lot of work to do to make sure that we are addressing disparities. And, and I think it's important to point out that I know, for, at least from a public health perspective, kind of like I said earlier, I, we're always needing to ask who are we not reaching yet with vaccines and um, who, has been, who has been most affected and how do, we, how do we get vaccines? So again, as we get more and more vaccine, we're looking at all kinds of different strategies to get vaccine into the community. Um, I saw in the chat the question about flu clinics and absolutely, I mean, our plan is to be out in the community when we get to that second phase. We, we want to be on site. That's what public health normally does. We, we go out to apart, low income apartment buildings. We go to our food shelves. We go to our mobile home parks. We go to places where we know there might be harder issues with access or transportation and things like that. And so we're looking at all of those ways to get vaccine out there. Um, want to make sure we're addressing um, disparities across the board. And so it's coming uh, as soon as we get more vaccine and can get through these first groups. Yes, we want to get there. And Christine, haven't we talked about some kind of a mobile unit that, we, that, we're, that we're working on to, to make sure we have a, a, an ability to get out into the communities and get closer to people so make sure that they can get vaccinated? Yes, we are really fortunate. Um, we are very fortunate that we are able to secure a unit that's going to allow us to more effectively and efficiently get COVID vaccine out. So we have a mobile clinic trailer that our um, folks here at the county that work on our vehicles have been able to, to outfit for us. And we are so excited to use it because when we get to that point, we're out in the community getting vaccine. Um, that's where we really start to feel like we're we're getting out into the ends of this, you know, this rollout. So yes, we're very fortunate. Um, can't wait to use it. It's gonna be a great tool. And as we've said all along, you know, this stuff is just starting to roll out. And it, one of the things that's confusing is that the county. Um, has been asked to do specific groups and we are um, vaccinating specific groups right now. We are not really doing the, even the 65 and over, let alone some of the um, subsequent um, priority groups that are out there until we get through the healthcare workers, which we are just about done with. And until we get through um, the, the school um, educators and um, child care workers, those are the areas that the county specifically is, is, is vaccinating right now. Um, but once we get through those priority groups, then we will probably be opening it up to things like, uh, like uh, Christine just mentioned as, as ways of getting out there to make sure that people get vaccinated. So it's coming. Uh, by the, folks, we're down to about the last 10 or 15 minutes. And 
as we as we get to the close, I will kind of rapidly go through a few more questions. One is uh, it's not COVID related um, directly, but it was the question from Sherry that was emailed in, and I'm I'm summarizing. I apologize, Sherry, but basically it's it is so cold outside. Does Dakota do any? Did Dakota County do anything to help families experiencing homelessness? And yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to try to, we, can, can you take a really fast? You want me to try? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, oh, gosh. Um, you know, we've recognized the, the, the problem of homelessness here in Dakota County um, uh, for quite some time and um, um, have all kinds of resources that, that are available to people if, if they're in that kind of a, of a uh, crisis situation. Um, we do have even a, a crisis, housing crisis hotline. Um, 651-554-5751. If, if you're experiencing homelessness and haven't got a place to stay, it's, it's, a, it's a number you can call, but we've been working with um, area churches, um, an organization called Matrix. Um, right now, um, I understand that the Salvation Army has opened up um, places for people. So if you're in that situation, um, give us a call and we'll find you the resources or try to find you a place to stay so you're not out there in this kind of weather. You just don't want to be. Lori, I know this is a, a huge issue for you as well. Did you want to speak to it? Yes, thanks, um, Joe. And, and one thing I think it's important to note, uh, it was uh, very visible a couple of years ago that there um, was a... a collaboration between area churches and Dakota County when we had a cold snap like this. And um, uh, I recently asked the question um, because, uh, I, you know, the, my church wasn't um, participating in, in this uh, this year. And, and I asked why. And, and it's because we have more shelter um, uh, beds available at the county um, uh, through uh, our regular county partners and so we're not needing um, the same level of emergency shelter that we've needed in the past which is good. Um, the other thing I think it's important to note is that um, in the past few years Dakota County um, commissioners, thank you to the veterans here on the board, have um, really focused on rapid rehousing and um, creating stable um, housing, so providing services along with housing so that um, homelessness is not cyclical um, that it is an experience in somebody's life that gets to end. Um, and so uh, I think that we are also seeing um, the success of, of previous programs um, that, that the county has been putting together and, and, and the focus on rapid rehousing. So um, we have a meeting this week with uh, MICA, uh, which is a faith-based group that focuses a lot on housing. So um, we'll get to hear more um, uh, from them uh, as, as well. But uh, it's a very important role that the county plays and I'm uh, very grateful to everybody. There's um, everything from drop-in centers for youth in Apple Valley to um, our uh, uh, youth uh, center in, in uh, Egan um, to uh, family um, housing that allows uh, families, including dads, which is uh, housing men has been a problem. It's, you know, a lot of times they'll take moms and, and kids and not dads, but uh, there's been a real effort to expand um, how and who we house and, and how quickly um, those situations be, can become permanent housing as opposed to temporary, so. One of the things that we're particularly excited about in Dakota County is the uh, Cahill Place. And um, Joe, I know you're familiar with this too. Um, a, a, a housing uh, a project that um, we, we was built, and I think it just opened up uh, here just in the last few months to house 40 families that were um, homeless and now will be given permanent supportive housing. So not only um, providing emergency shelters, which is kind of what you're talking about when you're talking about the cold, but we're also working to provide some permanent housing for um, these people so they aren't homeless anymore um, and provide them the services to, to help them for, for whatever reason it was that they were homeless it was because they you know, couldn't get a job or they had other issues, um, provide them um, daycare, um, help them become um, productive members of society in a, in a permanent and stable place. And so 
Um, it's something that um, we're very excited at, that um, we were at the forefront of, of that kind of initiative here in Dakota County. Thank you both. Um, I'm gonna take a swing at the, the last question we're gonna take was one that was emailed in by Robert uh, regarding the construction of a building on Highway 55 that he heard is a county building. It is in fact, Robert, a county building. Um, it's called the Smart Center. It's the uh, Safety and Mental Health Alternative uh, Regional Treatment or Training Center, I'm sorry. And the uh, the point is to treat, or I'm sorry, it's getting getting late for me. It's, it's a training facility for first responders. Uh, police officers and other first responders in de-escalation and crisis intervention. It will also house our uh, drug task force as well as the electronic crimes task force. Uh, for those wondering where it's at, uh, it's on Highway 55 and Courthouse Boulevard in Invergrove Heights. Uh, it's hoped to be a model for uh, other uh, uh, folks around the region uh, as it serves that, uh, that role that individual police departments and first responders may not have the ability to do on their own, but together, working together, we're able to provide that sort of training. Kathleen or Lori, did you want to speak to that? Otherwise, I'm going to look to you guys for some, some wrap-up. No, you, you're, you, you were right at the front end of that whole thing, Joe, so uh, you, you're the best to uh, explain what the Smart Center is, and it's, it is a, it's a great addition to Dakota County and to the region, actually. Um, it's beyond Dakota County. And you knew the acronym. I'm so impressed. I always forget the acronym or what it stands for. So thank you. And, and uh, Commissioner Halverson, who was state representative Halverson, when uh, the state helped with the grant for that and helped us get the money. Our legislator, <laughs> legislative delegation were very, very helpful in securing the, the funds for that regional training center. Um, thanks again to everyone for joining us. Kathy, Lori, or Christine, any uh, any closing comments or contact information or anything else that you want to provide? Kathleen? Well, I just know it, it's very confusing for people and it's frustrating, um, but it is the beginning of a massive effort. I don't think we've ever done anything like um, this kind of a vaccination effort um, in, in, in our country ever, um, certainly on the timetable that we're on. So um, we, um, as I mentioned, just in the last few weeks have made so much um, uh, improvement in this process uh, and more and more vaccine is coming. So um, if you are um, in line or in the lottery or um, still looking for vaccine, um, you know, just, just keep at it. And um, eventually um, we're all gonna get it. Um, it's just gonna take a little bit. There's just not enough vaccine for 333 million people in, that we have in this country, so. Thank you, Lori, any, any further comments, remarks? Uh, go Wildcats, my son's off to basketball practice. <laughs> um, so you saw me get distracted there. Um, and uh, wanted to just say um, thanks to everybody who joined us. This is a wonderful turnout, thanks to um, uh, Joe and Kathleen for um, inviting me to be a part of this conversation. Um, it's really wonderful to be part of, of the work of Dakota County. And as, as you heard, I mean, Dakota County is really here to make sure that uh, the, the residents of this district are uh, healthy and safe and um, uh, prosperous. And so, and we wanna help you. I put in the chat a link to our um, government uh, board pages so that you can follow along with any meetings um, or find our contact information. And don't hesitate um, to contact um, any of us and we can uh, help you find, I always say, I don't, I don't know people, but I know people who know people. So we can find you um, the connections that you need with the county and, and help you navigate uh, um, what can be a very complicated place sometimes. So thanks a lot and stay in touch everybody. Point. Thanks, Laurie. Christine, we're going to go to you finally, and uh, we say it a lot, um, and we genuinely mean it. Uh, you're on the front line, you and your colleagues in public health and, and among first responders and our nurses, uh, teachers, um, all those folks, we, we genuinely appreciate it. And then besides that, we make you work all day, and then you're on this meeting with us tonight. <laughs> uh, so I can't tie on behalf of Commissioner Gaylord and Halverson, and I thank you so much for joining us. Any, any closing comments? 
Any final bits of advice? Stay warm and keep keep watching for when you can get that shot. We cannot wait to immunize everybody as well. We are this is we're working as hard as we can. We've got a whole fleet of people ready to vaccinate. That vaccine as it's coming in, we are getting it out. So keep keep tracking where it's at. We are um, very uh, dedicated to getting this out as fast as we can. So um, hang in there, as we've said, and um, thank you for inviting me. Thanks so much, Christine. It's always so nice to have you join us. I, I'd be remiss, by the way, if I didn't thank Nathan Hansen and Mary Beth Schubert from Dakota County's communications team, uh, leadership team, uh, for putting all this together to make sure that we were able to, to almost look seamless in how we did it. For anyone who joined us uh, late, uh, we will repost this. Uh, Nathan will have it up, I believe, tomorrow morning so that you can watch it again on YouTube. Uh, or even if you saw the whole thing and just want to go back and watch it one more time because it was just such good entertainment compared to what's on cable TV lately. Whatever, uh, whatever is good for you is good for us. Um, feel free to uh, reach out to any of us if you have additional questions or concerns. And with that, uh, we wish you all, as Christine said, stay warm, get vaccinated as soon as you can. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again next time. Thanks, everybody. Have a good evening.